Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this very special episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast, episode number 153. Posting the edited audio of our live podcast session from last month at South by Southwest EDU. Uh, so this is just a great professional milestone and goal for me. I'm so proud of uh, being able to do it and uh, how everything went. I was a little nervous, but I uh, look forward to hopefully doing more stuff like this in the future, hopefully being back at the conference next year. Uh, but this is a great session uh, titled Adapting to the Hybrid University. Great wide ranging conversation, a lot of good stuff linked out to you in the show notes. So definitely go check that out and connect with all of our panelists. Uh, but without further ado, this is episode number 153, live from South by Southwest EDU. All right, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming to our session here as a live episode of the Hired Geek podcast talking about adapting to the hybrid university. Um, so yeah, I think this will be you know, generally applicable to, to most people, um, just sort of the trend lines that have been happening over the past two years uh, affecting higher ed, but certainly higher, uh, education at large. Yeah, I'll do a brief introduction of myself as well. I'm the creator and host of uh, the Hired Geek podcast, been doing it for several years, talking to people all across the higher ed ecosystem, both on campus and off, uh, about what they do, how they do it, why they do it. And uh, yeah, super excited to be here to record a live episode of the show. Uh, but we will go down in order here with brief introductions, your name, uh, where you work, and your professional background. Hey, hello everyone, welcome. I'm uh, Kelvin Bentley. I serve as a senior consultant with uh, WGU Labs, affiliated with Western Governors University. And I live in Leander, Texas, so not too far from here. And uh, again, thanks for coming. Cool. I forgot you were from. You lived in Texas. That's fun. Um, I'm Matt Tower. I work for a venture studio called Workshop, which focuses on uh, ed tech and climate businesses. Um, I've been in the higher ed industry for a while now, um, almost 10 years, uh, with startups, with big publishers, and uh, with some online universities. So uh, it's kind of a fun, fun mix of the different aspects of the higher ed industry. Um, and I live in Philly. Awesome. So hi, I'm Sierra Hamagishi. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada, and I've been on all different sides of higher ed as well, from marketing, admissions, international education, uh, the boot camp space, and then I started getting into the uh, technology partnerships with higher education. So now I do most of my work uh, consulting mainly with Unity Technologies, so kind of in the really, I'm still learning about it, technology side of those partnerships. Awesome. So uh, really quickly, too, before we get into the actual uh, content of our conversation, uh, I will be keeping an eye on the uh, Q&A on the South by Southwest app. So if you want to submit questions on there, you can do it both anonymously or uh, with your name. Uh, we'll go through those questions at the end. I'll also kind of pregame us here with a brief definition of the hybrid university. The way that we're thinking about that is it's really is a byproduct of the past two years, uh, sort of what it's going to be carrying forward in the short term of you know everybody having to pivot to remote learning and that really just leaving an impact on what students expect and how universities operate uh, where students can shift their, mo their modality of learning. Uh, they can be on campus but taking most of their classes online um, or mostly online coming in onto campus for certain things. Uh, having staff members faculty working remotely or uh, working hybrid, and then uh, classes themselves, individual courses being facilitated in a way that uh, you know students are maybe only coming together uh, in person a few times in the semester, otherwise doing other coursework and expectations online. Uh, and you've already seen a lot of programs where it's a completely online social work program, but they have you know placement portions of that. Um, so there's already a lot of precedent, a lot of institutions that were facilitating learning in this way um, beforehand, and now they're kind of leaders because they've sort of set up their infrastructure to uh, facilitate hybrid learning uh, before all this. So, you know, the biggest thing too that we're gonna be talking about is that this new normal is supporting greater access and success for uh, your commuter students, your adult learners, working students. They all can just have, you know, a setup and resources that is more conducive to what they, they need to be successful throughout their studies. I think we'll just go through, again, kind of down the line in this order. So starting with you, Kelvin, what has been one of the most important changes in higher ed when it comes to hybrid universities? So just kind of starting really big picture, what is sort of like a major thing that's kind of captured your attention about this, this shift? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say the shift um, was pretty comprehensive. And so I think, you know, because we talk about a pivot, but then it's, it, you know, it's, it's amazing to think that, you know, whole institutions uh, were rethinking how they were going to offer courses, how they're going to offer services. Um, and, um, and again, I think the pandemic definitely exposed a lot of gaps in services, um, which I, I saw early on um, back in 2001 when I actually got involved in online learning. I was working for a, a school in Louisiana, and um, you know, we were offering uh, courses and programs in psychology, which is my discipline, but, um, but we didn't always have um, you know, access to tutoring and all these other things. And so I'm just impressed that school, you know, schools found ways to offer services, uh, courses, programs, and uh, remote modality as much as they could um, so that they um, didn't lose students and they allowed students to kind of continue with their education. So. Uh, very impressed by that because, as we know, it's in the past it's been very piecemeal, and I think, uh, and that's just because of the model. It's a legacy model, you know, residential campuses, uh, physical places, um, and then online was kind of like a bolt-on, and so the pandemic flipped that, <laughs> and so it's interesting to see what schools did to, you know, help their students as best as they could. Yeah, I like that you describe it as piecemeal because it was like, well, we'll do a little bit of this and we'll do a little bit of that. And I think the part about COVID that I'm kind of curious to see where we land is if you think about the spectrum of like fully online and fully in person, I think most people are like, yeah, it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle. But like how we get to that middle is interesting. I think there are definitely some schools that are saying online worked out pretty well for us. Like financially, like from enrollment perspective, et cetera, like let's, let's go way out on this end of the spectrum from where we were. And then there's definitely some, some, you know, both institutions and individual faculty members who are like, that was awful. Like I'm going hardcore back in the other direction. Um, and I think for me, you know, looking at it from the venture perspective, it's like, what are the high ROI activities that we do both in person and online that get the student the best experience for them at you know, financially the kind of best <laughs> um, investment level for the school. And, and I think there's some stuff that you can do online that is really high ROI um, and doesn't involve a lot of time from the university. And there's some stuff that will, will be kind of pillars of in-person, um, you know, even for those kind of adult learners or continuing learners. Yeah, and just building on what both of you said, I what I'm most interested or excited about even is I feel like there was some very closed doors and I'm coming from the angle of like technology going into higher education, but I feel like it's opened a little bit of a crack because there isn't always a, as we said, some people did it because they had to and some people are going to kind of go back the other way. And I think tech isn't always the answer to everything, but there is some really cool technology that has been given that like little bit of a crack open and for some schools there's been more administration adoption or openness maybe by necessity but maybe some of them are like eh, you know that wasn't that bad uh, and so on the other side I think that creates a little bit more momentum and it was cool to see so many higher education even like ed tech here as well because I feel like it's been you know more k-12 to dominant so I'm excited to see what comes out of that. Like I know, you know, on our side, there's really cool things like a digital twin of a classroom, and maybe that's the answer to the in-person and the outside, and everyone wears the headsets. Maybe it's not, but I think it's been really exciting to see people play around with it a bit, and I think that's a bit of a silver lining as we might be a couple of years ahead in some of that adoption, and I hope we keep that momentum going forward. Yeah, and then um, when we were talking about this, that there's it was such a dramatic kind of overswing, like everything had to go online, but that did give people exposure to things that they maybe have been like, no, 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 no I don't even care to you know uh, interact with that. But people saw what was possible, and then yeah, we're going to have kind of I think the pendulum swing back towards the middle. And in terms of sustaining change, like that's something that I'm very curious about too. Is like, yeah, you would, you would think it might be a little bit easier because it's just like, well, we had exposure because you know we had no other choice, and then you know, it is going to still take a lot of thought and planning and consideration to sort of like think about, yeah, what worked well, what was, you know, is too much of this or not enough of that. So that it can be, you know, kind of building a coalition where it's like, we all agree that this is like, okay, these are the high impact things we want to do in person. And it's supplemented and augmented with all these great tools that are out there and not thinking that it's like, well, we went online and that's the death of, you know, this or that. It's just like, you know, let's 
put our heads together and not just completely backslide to where we were uh, beforehand. Um, because yeah, there's just a lot of great potential in all these different tools. Um, so moving on from that, I mean, my background is in student support and student success. So I, I love talking about this stuff of just, you know, the opportunities uh, with a hybrid university where, again, you're kind of uh, trying to get the best of both worlds and utilize different uh, tools and platforms. So um, maybe we'll just kind of keep going down this way. Um, uh, yeah, I'll just kind of put it simply. How do you see hybrid universities better supporting student success? Sure. And one thing that I think we um, also just need to highlight as well, because uh, I've worked for both universities and, and also community colleges, so our, our model is inclusive of, of those institutions as well. And so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, again, when I got involved in online learning, I was an assistant professor of psychology trying to build a fully online bachelor of science program online. And at the time, you know, we, uh, we were okay to, for the most part in terms of identifying the courses and the electives. Uh, this was, of course, before um, programs like Quality Matters, uh, you know, certain faculty development programs. Um, and so we were just really challenged just to do the, the courses. But the gaps, the, 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 there were even bigger gaps, though, in terms of access for students to do certain things like online proctoring, right? Um, and so in the early 2000s at schools that I worked for, um, you know, there wasn't really an online proctoring model. The, the online proctoring model back then was go, if you didn't live on campus, go to the public library and then you can, you know, talk to your, your, your teacher about having your exam forwarded to the librarian to be your proctor. That doesn't really work. It doesn't really scale well. Um, or, you know, go to your local church or, you know, synagogue and maybe, you know, your, <laughs> your priest or rabbi excuse me, your priest or rabbi or minister could be your, you know, your proctor. And so, um, so you know, I think we do, um, and this is what I think we're all kind of saying too, we need to be much more intentional in terms of what those online services need to be. And they need to be very fluid. So regardless of whether you're taking courses online or not, we need to make sure that there's an easy way for students to get you know, access to proctoring if the course requires a proctored exam. We need to also work with uh, students to make sure that they have access to, you know, academic advising, um, support. Um, you know, Georgia State University is also trying to do, I mean, not try, they've done, uh, they've had a lot of success around chatbots and also using them to help field uh, student questions because, you know, faculty and staff are not up 24-7. And so how can you expand uh, the types of questions that um, the answers that they would provide to students around their busy schedules? But it's really trying to think about online access, um, making sure that it is uh, available in a 24-7 way as best as possible because with work and work and life challenges that students have, especially adult students, you know, the nine to five schedule of the legacy model that we call higher education just doesn't work. I mean, I, I'd like to shamelessly promote one of your companies, which um, I think calls attention to, like, there are a lot of ways we did things like career counseling and academic advising that were people driven, which isn't a bad thing. I think like, you know, those types of advisors are super helpful, but um, are built for a pretty specific type of student um, and don't really have an inherent advantage beyond maybe an early uh, discussion of being in person. Um, like, you know, once you've picked your academic track, like you can do that asynchronously. Um, so I think being able to kind of break apart that model and, you know, with Lloyd, which is your company, like it does the advising asynchronously. So it's like, you know, if I'm having, you know, existential dread about what I'm gonna do after college, um, you know, I can go talk to my Lloyd career advisor at two in the morning. Um, versus having to wait a week to get an appointment with a human in a building that I have to travel to, you know, on a campus that I may or may not, you know, live close to. It's crazy. Um, so I think, like, being able to break apart stuff like that and say, like, what is actually providing value um, and, and when um, is something I'm excited about. And I think there's going to be a lot more of that type of thing. No, for sure. I think you both gave really good examples of, of how they could be. And I just wanted to even being here this week, I think, 
underscore the need to experiment with those. Like as the growing, we all know, like if you're, everyone here sounds like they're in higher ed, the growing group is gonna be a lot of these adult learners or people where the typical schedule doesn't work for them. So how does this not even become, you know, an add-on, but more actually the norm that a lot of things are just not offered in that, you know, working day schedule because the biggest thing I'm hearing is that's gonna create a greater level of community and inclusiveness because it feels like the services are actually designed for when you need them and the intentionality isn't that it's an add-on or it's a little bit here or there, or only some schools have it, but that we just have that flexibility as we know the way of the learner population is gonna be significantly different. So how do those services align with them and from the start just like, oh, that's so cool. Like, you know, like you can talk to them at two in the morning. That, that's the norm and then it feels like it's made for you and I think it'll be interesting to see retention and sense of community if with some schools start experimenting with that. Well, and sorry, Justin, but uh, <laughs> there, there, I think especially pre-COVID, there was like a ton of investment in like the enrollment side of things and that was important and I get why it happened, but I think particularly with, there's a demographic shift which you're talking about of there are fewer kind of traditionally aged 18 year olds who will be going to college over the next 10 years. So I hope that we see the investment shift more towards retention and advising and that type of thing. So it's like, it's not enough just to get you into school, but also we have to, we have to get you to persist. Um, and there's a couple of examples that have done well, like Inside Track has been around forever, but it, even that, I don't know if it was a smashing success um, financially. Um, Impact-wise, I think it has been. But, um, I'm hoping to see more examples of those types of companies pop up and, and even schools building out these services themselves, which I think is definitely doable. Right, yeah, I mean, again, there's, there's so many, um, there are different companies too. Uh, you know, for us, yeah, a, part of, um, a part of our team, ha you know, we have a business accelerator, so we invest in early stage ed tech companies as our, you know, we have kind of this comprehensive model of trying to impact the ecosystem, not just through WGU proper, but how can we do research uh, with vendors and then identify you know, best practices and all of that. So my hope too is that we're able to, um, yeah, I mean, kind of, again, plug the gaps, but then also collect better data about what we're doing. Um, and so that's, I hope we can do more of that. Like we do institutional research fairly well for compliance. Um, but we don't always do a great job because we're very decentralized. It's kind of like, you know, it's like cats, you know, we're kind of herding cats pregnant with kittens that soon will be pregnant with kittens. Like it's, it's very challenging to kind of follow uh, what's going on and with academic freedom being what academic freedom is, it's like we have to balance that, I think, with the responsibility of being truly uh, learner-centric, um, which we say a lot, but we don't actually, um, we don't do it a lot in practice in terms of those wraparound services and how we structure schedules for students. Capstone courses, for example, uh, might be available for students every other year. It's like, but why? Like, why don't we actually make more of our courses available, not just by modality, but much more often so that students don't have to skip a beat, so. Yeah, I appreciate what everybody's saying, because I think, and like, something that I've been thinking a lot about is that like the focus on retention I think is gonna be a story of uh, the next several years, which I think it's always been in the ether, but yeah, so much has been on like recruiting students, just like, you know, marketing enrollment, um, you know, I think it may be kind of shifting definitely over to retention and that like, there's so many aspects of like investing into embodying the principles of a hybrid university will protect you in terms of like, you know, yeah, being more learner centric, future proofing in terms of, you know, enrollment declines of the traditionally aged students and those sort of things. And I have been amazed at like, and curious to see how it goes moving forward, but like institutions, you know, getting laptops for students, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots, you know, emergency funds for, you know, unexpected expenses for students. Cause it's like all of that also helps, you know, like the hybrid university would recruit a more diverse learner that comes from a background, um, you know, that's gonna need more of that support to be successful. And yeah, again, it's like we were just, we we're able to see what was possible and I'm very curious to, you know, how much people are gonna say, well, we only did that because you had to, like, and it's like, well, I, if you have the right perspective, you still kind of have to, like, you'll have to have some level of investment in all of those resources and yeah, career coaching, student success coaching, and I love chatbots and I could, yeah, kind of geek out about those all day, but um, yeah, just having, services available at different times because you have students in different time zones and um, you know, yeah, they might be doing 
their field placement for their program uh, somewhere else, but they're gonna still need to be like, what am I registering for next semester? Or like, here's how my experience in my placement is going, or you know, still wanting to be in community with their fellow students and things that are going on on campus. So um, you just need different tools and kind of procedures for that. And I think, yeah, I'll, I'll sit on that point because I wanted to mention it. I think, Kelvin, you just had something when, uh, you wanted to say on this, but like the ideas around community building for students in a hybrid format. Yeah, if you wanted to share some thoughts on opportunities there. Um, at WSU Labs, we worked uh, with Rio Salado, for example. Um, some of you may have seen an article in Inside Higher Ed recently that talks about their use of one of the companies that we worked with called Inscribe to kind of help build a sense of uh, belongingness and, and community uh, with um, you know all of the students at you know Rio Salado during the pandemic, and that's just you know one example. But I think it's trying to you know find how can we leverage technology and people to to help people feel um, you know, again more connected with each other. Um, sometimes that's a challenge because again, if we're talking about it at the course level, you know if you're you know if you're in an asynchronous course too, you know you're kind of moving at your own pace. You may not really have a sense of the other students in the class because the class is not really based on group activities and those types of things. So how can we, you know, what additional connective tissue in my journey as a, as a student can I put out there? You know, are there um, opportunities for me to, um, you know, join Zoom calls where there's, uh, you know, guest speakers and things like that. I mean, schools do that all the time. Uh, you know, school organizations trying to also gather folks uh, remotely as well as you know face to face but it's trying to figure out like outside of courses can schools do a better job of actually you know um, again reinforcing those connections um, we're even working with an alumni engagement company called protopia which is very interesting where their platform I think does a, a really good job of kind of connecting alumni who want to contribute back to their institution through um, through asking questions. We do this already, like on Facebook and things like that, like, hey, like I'm going on a vacation, uh, can you tell me the, the best place to stay? But with Rotopia, it, it's nice because it works in the background, it gives you as alumni, alumni a chance to connect back with current students at a particular school, at your, alum, at your alma mater, um, and then you can actually do kind of pseudo mentoring uh, as well as um, you know, just maybe you work for a company that uh, a student uh, is interested in getting into, and so you can build those connections a little bit better than some of the uh, networks that are out there, um, like Handshake, where everyone's just kind of on the platform, but then there's not always that, um, you know, connectedness um, that's needed, where there's active people, um, you know, following through with questions and answers. So, um, so I'll pause there. I, I think, like, one of the things that I am curious about and have no idea what the answer is, is um, how connected like, any sort of community effort has to be to the academics that the student is taking at that point in time. So, um, and I think we're considering this in the working world too, where it's like, do I have to go to my company's office to get the value of being in an office? Um, or can I just go to a co-working space near me? Um, similarly for students, like, to persist through college, do I need to be like in the same academic, you know, structure as, you know, the people around me or that studying the same thing? Like traditionally, I think we've segmented into your major. Like you hang out, if you're an engineering major, you hang out with other engineers. Um, or can it just be more of a library environment where it's like, you know, you study English, I study engineering, you study architecture, and we're all kind of okay with that because we're there's value in us just like sitting together. So that connection to academics, I think, is is mysterious to me. No, it's a, uh, yeah, just throwing in there. When you were saying that, remind me, I was going to speak about uh, later. Is that's one thing that's kind of pulled from the bootcamp model too? Like a lot of them have experimented with. We don't have a physical space, but if you have multiple years together, especially for like some harder subjects, you get that like mentor aspect of like the second year, third year, and then you get the knowledge um, of even teaching someone. So you. But then the cross one, yeah, maybe the interesting projects or programs or something like that where you have cross collaboration projects. I'm not as sure about that one, but the multi-year one or physical location in the same space and get that peer mentorship, I think is interesting. Yeah, the hybrid college model is also very interesting to me because I think, you know, they're, they're really kind of targeting, uh, I don't know how many people know about hybrid colleges. There's one here in Austin called Peloton U. They're typically hyper-local and so, um, the duet um, 
a hybrid college uh, was kind of one of the first ones, and it was a partnership between uh, SNU and the folks that kind of created Duet. So the idea is, you know, it's a CBE, competency-based education model, online, but we're gonna actually have like a physical space, right, for students to actually like come, get to know each other. Uh, sometimes, again, the home environment, um, and especially, you know, uh, the, the home environment can be very chaotic, so like working from home for many of us is, you know, is okay, but, you know, uh, in, in for some people, home is not really, it's one of the last places you actually wanna be in terms of trying to like, you know, um, take courses and complete a degree, and so, uh, I like that model because at least there they're trying to say, yeah, you can do some things online, you can come to a physical space that's safe, uh, you could also meet other students, get reinforcement and encouragement from them. Uh, and so that network um, is very interesting to follow. Uh, TRIO uh, is also trying to take the, uh, the TRIO New College Network is trying to take the Duet model and actually like scale it across different cities. They're in three now, uh, two in New Jersey, Camden and, um, and uh, Newark, New Jersey, and then the other one is in Detroit, which is my hometown. So that's why I'm kind of bullish on them because uh, I'm a native Michigander living in Texas for some reason, but um, <laughs> it's because of Austin, Austin School, but the rest of Texas, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, politics. Um, but anyway, um, so, <laughs> but, but I think, you know, again, uh, I think the hybrid model is kind of cool. The hybrid college model is cool because it's intentionally saying, yeah, we, we do need a mix. Um, and not to say that universities and community colleges can't do that as well. Um, but the cool thing there, I think they're also saying, yeah, we're going to provide this competency-based mastery model, uh, which not all colleges and universities have embraced. So, maybe in the next few years that'll happen too. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking just a lot of stuff with what everyone's mentioned of like, I think there's like a sliding scale of a lot of these things because it could be like, okay, I'm a fully online student, but I do want to have the opportunity in some places, uh, you know, institutions or programs have dabbled with like, you know, having a co-working membership so you could try to just like have a place to study that's, you know, quiet and you can focus and those sort of things. And then you have, you know, a lot of students, even if they're online, study within a certain geographic radius. So it's like, do we just, you know, make sure that they feel welcome and you know have the ability to get uh, into the spaces you already have on campus. And then, yeah, I mean, there's one part of this conversation is all about the tools, uh, but I like that we were kind of talking about the philosophy that we'd go in engaging students where I've heard that a lot of times it is gonna be tethered to the academic experiences where you want in that class there to be a lot of collaboration and socialization because people are gonna wanna talk about what they're studying to process it together and you know, again, on sort of the sliding scales, you'd probably want to, you know, still have those opportunities for just like the whole community to come together where it's just different people colliding because they're all seeing a great speaker. Um, and then you'd also kind of want to have the sliding scales of, yeah, the in-person live things that you, you know, you just had to be there for, but people still could like watch a live stream but they can't physically be there, so they, but they still feel part of it. And then asynchronous engagement opportunities where it is like, yeah, we have a Slack channel for our program or our school or just the whole college where, chat's happening, you jump in when you're able and you know see the resources or things that people are talking about. Um, so yeah, you can kind of like dabble with a lot of those things, yeah. Well, and this extends to the faculty too. Um, I think we're trying, I think this is happening more in K-12 um, with the flipped classroom model where the teacher is becoming a lot more of a coach than they are like a subject matter expert. Um, and that's like, you know, kind of a, funny concept to think about in higher ed where we're so used to the professor being, you know, they have a PhD in whatever specific thing you're learning. Um, even if you don't necessarily need to be like a super advanced math person to teach algebra or calculus or whatever. So I think that's something that feels maybe the furthest away from, from breaking in higher ed. That'd be a pretty big jump. Um, but I think it gets to like, what is the, the activity that actually helps the student. Do they need the like super expert or is it really they just need a you know push in the right direction? Um, right, like you could encourage, there's a lot of different ways again to do this. I've seen like um, you're embedding something in the LMS that makes the faculty more accessible to ask yeah. questions or a TA um, or uh, yeah, just even a different format where it's like you're engaging with you know clips of lectures and different content in the course, and then when you're having a live session or the class time, the, that interaction is different. It's not just you know being talked at for an hour and a half. It is that they're trying to coach through, you know, like, okay, so we reviewed all this content. What questions do people have? Or you know, those sort of things. And um, 
yeah, and I did kind of want to talk about like the learning environment too, and I'll, I'll stick with you to start with this, Matt, um, is like, yeah, students being able to flow between online and in person, like that being definitely a big principle of the hybrid university and just implications of that, because I know we, 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 when we were prepping kind of talked about this of like, you know, how that might be um, facilitated or structured for students because like, they would have that choice and it's like, well, we could sort of encourage them to do it in a way that might be more conducive to their success. Yeah, and I think like this is the fun uh, question of like how much agency do you give students? Because <laughs> it's, you know, if you give a, particularly a traditional college student a choice, they're probably going to choose to not go to the classroom if they don't have to. Um, so uh, it's how much do you force a, a choice? How often do you force a choice? What type of space do you give to them? Like, um, again, drawing from like the working world, there's two schools of thoughts on returning to the office. One is, you know, top down, we're mandating that you have to come back, um, which, you know, we're seeing in all the papers, workers are not super excited about. And then there's another where, you know, uh, I was talking to John Katzman who founded Noodle, that where you work, and he's like, yeah, we're getting a like kick butt uh, space that we, we think our employees will want to come to. Like we're gonna get an awesome gym, we're gonna have awesome like facilities in the space, you're gonna really want to be there. Um, and I, I can imagine a scenario where that's also true on college campuses. Um, they obviously have a lot more built infrastructure, so it's a little bit harder to change the way, you know, Noodle can just like go to a different building and build it out differently. Um, but I would love to see something like that, where it's like we're trying to earn students' uh, belief that they should go to class rather than mandating like you gotta go sit in the like little lecture chair. Yeah, and to help make, them, I mean, I think, um, again, back to like this idea too of of schools needing to be more learner centric, right? Like the student voice is key. And again, um, and again, and I'm not hearing to necessarily beat up higher ed because I've been in higher ed for over 20 years and you know, as a teacher, as an administrator, as a consultant. But again, there's a huge opportunity for us. Like if we have an institutional research office, I think we really need um, key people, you know, data scientists, folks, uh, who have, uh, again, a research acumen to kind of help schools collect the data that will, you know, help students make a more informed decision. So that agency that we give them hopefully will be a reflection of data, like data patterns. Um, my, my hope, too, is that simply maybe, you know, to kind of make it more tactical, can we do a better job, for example, in terms of really exposing or lifting up the hood for students about what they're getting themselves into? We do that on a basic level, if you think about it, through syllabi that we post, right? And so students have a kind of a general sense, but if they could even have an opportunity to see some of the videos, I guess, that are being posted or, or to even have more of an opportunity in webinars to talk to past students, right, who talk about what the class was like for them, what the challenges are, what are some things they could be um, doing to, to you know, prep themselves, motivate themselves. And I don't think we do uh, enough of that. I think there, there are examples there. Um, but the more that we can make higher education more transparent, uh, as well as you know the modalities and the services, but that transparency layer is missing. Um, and if I had all the money in the world, what I would do is I would try to find a way to um, actually you know give schools funds to actually create some type of transparency, a transparency practice, right? So um, helping them to actually do more to show that um, the types of courses, the programs, and, and share that information easier um, so that it's much more accessible than it is today. I would love if there were teaser trailers for courses, like that idea where it's just like three minutes or less, professor is saying like, this is what's going on. Because like usually all it is is like a paragraph of text that's maybe, you know, kind of bland, and that idea that you can kind of see that. And I think sort of like where my, I'm like connecting some dots in my head is like, you know, you have students who can free flow, choose an online course or in person and, you know, any mix of those that they want. And then like certain courses they could have a choice of is like you have an in-person section or an online section. And then maybe even making it clear like, well, this one, this, you know, first year seminar course, we have small in-person sections like, you know, because we 
have looked at the numbers and you know we find that students you know rate higher higher levels of satisfaction with building community making friends on campus or you know those sort of things and then these other courses they do incredible online but just because they really benefit from you know various tools or you know things like that so um, yeah because I know we, we talked a little bit about that of like you'd want to sort of shepherd it and yeah like give students some choice but that they at a certain point in their studies, like if it is like, well, you maybe want to be more in person in your first year and then kind of, you know, have a little bit more flexibility moving forward. So again, like it, there's not going to be sort of the only one best way to do this. You have to think through like, what is our strategy? Like what's the kind of experience that we want to give to our students and have kind of a transparency around the justification for why, not just like, well, I'm kind of, you know, shooting from the hip here. It's just anecdotal just because I said so, because I, you know, whatever it's, um, based on like, especially because any place should have that basis where it's like, yeah, we, I mean, we had to try this. We were online and we, you know, hopefully are surveying our students and analyzing that data and uh, are utilizing that to inform strategy moving forward. Um, so really quickly too, because I'm always curious on that because I think it's just had such a boom in the past couple of years and certainly a lot uh, over the past two is, you know, your boot camps, your short courses, other forms that are not, you know, enrolling in a uh, four-year degree program, um, how do they factor into the strategy of a hybrid university? And just for the, we'll go backwards this way yeah. this time. Yeah, sounds good. And I feel like uh, just coming from different angles that uh, Kelvin and Matt will probably talk a lot more about, uh, you know, laddering or, or how we're going to fit those all together. But having spent a little bit of time in the boot camp space, uh, as I alluded to earlier, I think it is interesting to look at them, and I know I would totally recognize that they had uh, none of the restrictions that a traditional university or a community college would have, but there are some interesting, I think, aspects to play with, like the one we already talked about, about the physical space, the idea of, you know, like a technology queuing system for uh, how you would have answers at asynchronous courses or times where you're doing things independently, as well as another one I'd really like to look at is the, the cohort model and that kind of, um, someone who's in charge of your career services and it has that group to pull them through. I think all of those are reasons why they've seen a lot of traction or a lot of people have decided to go through them because they really know of what's gonna push through afterwards. I don't think they've all done them to the same success level and I realize there's restrictions on how those could be incorporated, but I think in terms of people wanting to go to campus, I know some of the boot camps that have gone fully online they, some of them are wanting that in person because it's technical and they really want to be there and that they're going to invest that much money, they want to be around a person. So there's some aspects to look at them in general and, and how they've structured those in both the boot camp world and another one I'm close to continuing ed world where people are really, really choosing to be there. And then as we know that's the growing population, what do they have that they're doing well? And then uh, what could you maybe play around in that area of the institution to see what might work for our, our more like, what do we call it, like, traditional one as well? Because some of them might take a continuing ed or a really interesting like technical course. So that's just my my angle of it coming more from the technology side and like having been in a boot camp. I know there was a lot of people that chose that for specific reasons, but I agree what you guys will probably get more into. They have to be intentional and they have to like, uh, for some people, you don't want it to be too big of a sell and not really lead somewhere, so there's a caution on the other side too. Yeah, well, and I think the market across even traditional universities too, like if you think boot camp short courses, traditional universities is just really chaotic because like every single player in the ecosystem is trying to, you know, win people to their specific solution, right? So like the boot camps are gonna say like, come here, we'll get you a hundred thousand dollar job in three months, like super pithy pitch. The short courses are like, you can have, you know, a Google stamp on your resume. And the traditional universities are like, you know, your average, your expected earnings are a million dollars higher if you get a degree through us. But um, they all have an agenda, right? Like everybody's like winning to their side. And then, you know, if you choose a boot camp, it means you don't choose a short course or you don't choose a university. So I think the area that I'm excited for on a macro level is somebody who's gonna like help steer me through and who doesn't have a vested interest in me going to a specific boot camp or a specific short course provider or even a specific university. Um, and I think there are websites that like do this kind of, but most of them get a kickback on the back end that's like, oh, you know, we, we, we talk about all the universities, but really there's like seven that we prefer you go to. Um, 
So I think there's a model somewhere that says, like, we're going to help you effectively navigate this where you could actually stack them. Um, I think that it is a really exciting concept. Um, but I don't know really of any players in the ecosystem that um, can do that as an actual neutral arbiter that don't have you know, some incentive to place you in a specific uh, program. Yeah, that's a good point. Like it, it, you know, it's interesting to see what will happen to, and maybe this is kind of off topic a little bit, I've been thinking uh, about the, uh, the Amazon Career Choice Program. So many of you have probably heard um, you know, Amazon decided not to go with an intermediary like Guild Education and others. Like they're trying to provide a way for their employees to you know, continue their education or start their education, get credentials. There's over 140 schools you know, that Amazon has blessed you know, to be a part of this program, which is interesting. But then, um, so I, you know, I just wonder, like, I love to see the data over time in terms of like, yeah, what, what um, because it includes, I think, short course programs too, yep, or, right? So, so it'll be interesting just to see, like, given that there's so many choices, I'm hoping that Amazon can be neutral on some level. Uh, I mean, obviously they're biased because they picked at least, you know, they picked the 140 plus schools and there's over 7,000 um, providers, you know, based on IPEDS data that provide college uh, degrees and certificates and all of that. And so it'll be interesting just to see how they steer students uh, and maybe there are some good practices there. Maybe actually you're on to something about maybe, um, you know, we need to, get venture capitalist funds and actually kind of create some type of, because we've talked about career coaching, right, but maybe there is like a, a long life education coach that can actually help, yeah. you know, steer uh, students. I, the ironic thing is like the, the way to stay neutral is to have the customer pay you directly, right, instead of getting a referral fee. But the irony is like students are students often because they don't have the money, right? They don't, they're trying to get a higher paying job. So there's like this dissonance where you can't ask the student to pay you directly and as soon as you take money from a, a different provider, you, you lose your neutrality. I just wonder what's gonna happen because there's a hundred, you know, if there's 140 schools, they all vary on terms of tuition. Um, you know, the modality is almost kind of like, you know, whatever, it's like online, face-to-face. -face. Not all of them are uh, competency-based education providers, so it'll be interesting just to see if Again, a WGU or a SNU or some of the larger, you know, the mega universities that have done well in online, will they basically still dominate um, across those schools um, be because they, they have, <laughs> so to be continued. Yeah, I'm very interested in uh, stackable credentials and I feel like it's like, well, mark that one off on your bingo card. I feel like we've, you know, another buzz, uh, buzzy word from like the conference, but, uh, cause yeah, I think it, there's so much there about like, time and cost for students if they're kind of just like navigating on their own it's like well actually if you took this aws you know certificate it can actually at a particular place lead you towards getting uh you know some other certificate or other uh credential and yeah it's tough if like if you can navigate through it's sort of agnostic but it, like certain institutions have really uh, done well at that or different platforms uh, that have short courses on them uh, help get like preferred admission or give credit for uh, degree programs. So I feel like all of that, you know, I think has happened a lot more in the online space as part of the strategy of like a hybrid university and a way to uh, potentially bring more students in. But and I know some people came in late. Uh, I am keeping an eye on the uh, Q and A on the South by Southwest app. So after this question, I'll check in there for uh, any questions that folks have for us. But um, as I always do on my podcast, we will end with a final thought or call to action uh, on this topic. So um, I guess we'll take it back around this way. Uh, Caleb, if you want to kick us off, any final thought, call to action? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that my call to action is, again, transparency. How can we actually help students know um, what they're getting themselves into in terms of uh, the courses and programs we offer, regardless of modality? Um, we need to be much more intentional uh, and strategic in terms of how we actually create this idea of the hybrid university. And maybe, you know, maybe again, another way to think about it is it's the hybrid student, right, or the digital learning student. Like, how do we, how do we actually again provide flexible services, courses, programs, uh, unbundle them, you know, so that. Uh, again, students uh, don't have to eat the whole hog. Maybe I'm in Texas too long, so apologies for saying that for all our vegetarians out there. But you know, how do we actually help students really 
you know, take on higher education in bite-sizable chunks that work for them around their schedule. Um, so I think those are the things. And we need to do a much better job of data collection. So if we're going to throw technology and we're going to experiment with modalities and we're going to do all this stuff, let's collect the data. And if IR, institutional research, can do it, let's create new units. Let's get the right people uh, involved to do it, working with the faculty, because again, faculty are very decentralized, right? So how do we actually learn from uh, their power, their academic freedom? How do we actually glean uh, good practices from them? And, uh, and, and, and also, let's not lose the learner. So let's ask the learner repeatedly, you know, how's our driving, right? How's our education? How, you know, how, you know, what is your experience like? And let's not just wait until after the course or after they, they leave us, let's you know ask them repeatedly uh, during their time with us in whatever ways we can. Yeah, so we talked at the beginning of the spectrum of like fully online to fully in-person colleges, and I think what I'm excited for is the diversity of options I think we'll see um, on that spectrum across the landscape. We've got, I think it's like 4,500 degree granting universities in the US right now. Um, my hope is that we see you know, all 4,500 of them placing bets along the spectrum and saying, you know, we're going to do, you know, they won't actually pick a percentage, but call it 60% online, 40% in person. And, you know, the college down the street that, you know, previously offered fairly similar programs is going to be 35%, you know, online and 65% in person. So I think that is potentially really exciting. It's a little bit terrifying um, because I think, you know, there's definitely a chance for a lot of institutions to go out of business, but my hope is it leads to a lot of experimentation and um, in the super long term that we find a, a happy medium that's actually better for the student. Um, I have no idea what percentage it is, um, but I'm excited for the experimentation. Yeah, for sure. And I would take, I guess, a partnerships angle to everything. I feel like, uh, you know, it's exciting and there's a lot of things that we could whiteboard or look at a lot of examples or technology I mentioned and it could definitely feel overwhelming, but the way I like to structure them and like, you know, getting to those percentages or incorporating a lot of those services is, I guess, to take this some of the scary part away for schools is kind of those first steps. Like I've seen a lot of um, success when they maybe just start with something that's non-credit or something that's lower stakes and experiment with how you want to do that. Um, in this hybrid environment or, or one of the ones that's naturally more technical by nature and, and see that first step really get, as Kelvin said, like the student feedback along the way and and why I go toward the non-credit or the continuing ed is because I mentioned like a lot of them like really want to be there and they're paying to be there and, and they're going to be the most open to it and so fitting to the that student or just one aspect first I think is a, a good area to start and then I've seen it ripple back well into you know more the undergrad or the masters or the other areas as well. So that would just be my kind of, I'll let Dustin take it home, but my, my kind of advice if all of that felt like that's a long to-do list if you're a higher education institution. Yeah, because I think what we had talked about too is like, I mean, yeah, some places don't even get any student feedback or satisfaction. And then it's like that and really being smart about showing like, okay, well, we implemented a new tool or did something different. Like, did more students pass the class? Did we see higher retention? Did we see, you know, yeah, I mean, like, even just, like, less stress, because I think sometimes it could be, like, yeah, an ed tech tool says, like, students love using our platform, and it's, like, cool, okay, so, does, like, what is the impact of that, of, like, they're using it, they're engaging with it, does it actually, you know, um, help, you know, kind of produce those outcomes that everyone is looking for? Um, but, yeah, I mean, we're kind of right on time, so I want to make sure we get to uh, questions in the time that we have left, um, and I really like this one, um, getting faculty and staff engagement around these adaptations to the hybrid university and something I think a lot about is like, you know, there can be kind of a burden on implementation and people actually utilizing like, hey, we got this shiny new, you know, uh, tool for uh, course design or, um, you know, something to kind of do like task management in your support office to, you know, get inbound requests and uh, do things like that. So any thoughts on that of helping to support, you know, with training and onboarding orientation faculty and staff around all these different ways of working and tools, those sort of things. Because I've, I've um, participated in faculty development planning around online over the years, I would say definitely 
similar to what we're talking about in terms of flexibility of information and access, I think faculty benefit from you know, having different flavors of faculty development experiences. So the more that you could actually have, you know, not just face-to-face -face things, but just in time uh, you know, experiences um, where folks can you know, meet online synchronously during webinars to learn about the technology. But then also, based on what you were just saying too, like linking it to why are we even doing this, right? I mean, um, because again, the headwinds will always be, I don't have enough time and you know, this is one more thing I have to do. I'm already burnt out because of the pandemic. So, but if you could link it back always to students, also um, having, you know, maybe even bringing in uh, guest speakers from other institutions that have tried to implement the technology um, and then ask them to bring on students to talk about what was the impact for them, right? Those stories will definitely help um, support any faculty development uh, opportunities that you make available, but it's connecting those dots. Faculty need to see that there's a benefit to students, and if you don't show that, it's much harder, like it's very easy for them to poo-poo it and say, oh, you're just making me do busy, you know, busy work, and I'm already, you know, I'm already oversaturated and uh, burnt out because you're asking me to innovate too much. I, I think also hire more teachers, um, like, <laughs> There's a there's this trend towards adjuncts, uh, which has been a long term trend, and you know adjuncts get paid like garbage, um, often treated like garbage, and like you know I if they're teaching four classes at four different you know colleges or universities, like yeah the, it's going to be hard to get them to change, um, but I I think there's a very very nascent trend towards hiring like professional teachers. Um, in the classroom. I, WPI, I think last year, was the first institution to offer a tenure track teaching position. So that's something, it, you know, we talked about experimentation, like that's something I'm really excited about. Um, I don't think that's really been a model, at least in the past hundred years, in higher ed. So you have to try stuff like that to, to see if you can get better faculty engagement that way. Yeah, and so I guess this would kind of bridge onto what Calvin was saying a little bit, because I definitely agree with you, but I think, uh, you know, if you don't get that or you kind of have the faculty that you have, if you pull back the curtain a little bit on, to be honest, like when you're selling into schools or you're in partnerships, I think the most important thing is to have that key player advocate, because if you push it on them, same as with the students, it's not going to ripple through. They're going to have all that same ripple back or the point like they're understaffed. So it's finding that advocate who's really interested in it and letting them kind of organically reach it out to the ones that make sense. And that's where I've seen the most traction. Like that's how you, to be honest, that's how you sell into a school. So that's the same way I think a school could have the philosophy of internal adoption. Like who do you make, uh, put into that role that maybe wasn't seen or heard as much and can be, that can be a new position for them to kind of mm -hmm. help lead that change. Right, and collect that data, right? So if you're piloting, you know, because I do believe in that organic spread, but I think what it, the danger, though, is just it could still die on the vine, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have your champion, and then um, he or she might just, you know, do it, or they they might do it in their class, but then it does it and never really scales. And so there has to be almost like that executive sponsor to say, yes, we're going to pilot, we're going to collect data, we're going to share that out, we're going to be transparent, and then we're going to use that information to decide what do we do next, right? Do we stick with this vendor? Do we? You know, maybe look at other vendors. We'll do a formal RFP process. What are we going to do to actually, you know, make this uh, technology or this pedagogical change stickier at our institution? Yeah. So. Well, I think, yeah, and like, if you commit to something, commit to it. I think because sometimes it could feel like, well, we, I mean, they have all this stuff. Like, why aren't they using it? It's like maybe you need to do an annual training. And I think a lot of like what I'm hearing too, which has been something I've heard a lot too, is like you know, you might have the, the vendor trainer come in and they're, they're really good at what they do, but like, there's sometimes just like the trust that, you know, if it's a fellow faculty, it's somebody they know, or, you know, those sort of things of getting a champion, all, all that kind of stuff, I think is a, a big part of the strategy. And then, yeah, follow through and, you know, the kind of nudges if you're seeing like, you know, yeah, great, we're seeing increased engagement with the tool and, you know, we're doing trainings, uh, you know, annually or as needed. Um, so yeah, all, all good stuff there. Uh, but I'll jump to another question. Because this one could be maybe like a quick rapid fire. Uh, what higher education tools and technologies do you see as core 
for hybrid learning. And one for me, because I could get about it, would be like chatbots, because that allows for this 24-7 accessible central point for a student to ask questions, hopefully get them answered, or then redirected to the best person to answer that question. So I feel like that's something that's core to hybrid learning. So I don't know, maybe if each of us just does more. Yeah. Yeah, learning management systems, of course, and then I would I would make a strong uh, case for tutoring, online tutoring systems, not just people who do tutoring, but then also systems like a tutor.com, for example, where the data actually uh, can be accessed by the faculty, so faculty can kind of track how students are doing in the tutoring sessions, and then use that data to make pedagogical changes um, in, in their instruction. Physical space, like, start from like if you want to offer a hybrid course like why should you have physical space and what does that space look like i know that's not a tech tool but like i think you <laughs> it, it's pretty core if you're really going to be hybrid otherwise mm -hmm. you should just be online if you can't right. answer that question mm -hmm. yeah i was going to say i felt like we were going to get a laundry this there i think it would just be even choosing the like, like you said earlier, like owning which one you're going to have because having 10 or 15 or whatever that we suggest, it's like people need one place to go, you know, for their learning. For, so it's a little bit one that's a little bit more of like a platform. I know that's a huge issue right now. So just kind of owning where the spot that the students are going to go. And I think that that's going to be really, really key because especially when you start not being in the physical space, you're getting those reminders, you have cognitive overload from everything you're learning. I think that almost like simplifying the technology in a way is what's really gonna make that a lot more successful. Yeah, I know we've all kind of name dropped a couple different um, uh, companies and stuff. One that I saw on the show floor that I was very imp uh, impressed with was uh, Pathified. It did that, it basically is like a dashboard that can aggregate SIS, LMS, and everything. So it'd be the one-stop shop that a student would go to and there's like, you know, you can see your clubs that you're involved in and all this stuff and if you're like, oh yeah, I see that it gives me this reminder of like, hey, you have an assignment due tomorrow, you'd click through and it would take you to the LMS, but like, you don't have to have like 20 bookmarks and you know different things. You would just be like, what do we need to do today? Like you just go to that dashboard, you can see all this stuff and submit a form to financial aid and you know, uh, the student can manage their workflow but also the, the institution. So um, I thought this was an interesting one. It might be just if one person has an answer to it, I kind of have my thoughts because yeah, we do have a lot of things that have developed around standard for online learning but not for hybrid learning. So that idea that we would want to have one of these, you know, institutions or, you know, organizations here try to outline that that would give people kind of some level of structure for how to maintain a certain level of quality because I've, you know, written and spoken about like, okay, these are the principles of a hybrid university. It would be like, okay, let's have the online learning consortium, you know, bring that together, get input, you know, like those sort of things. I'm, I'm curious if like folks think that that would be like a, at this stage, a valuable use of time is to have kind of a stamp of approval of like a, a rubric or? I can see it both ways. I mean, I think the Quality Matters program, the rubrics from the Online Learning Consortium are helpful. I think we almost need something else. So instead of like, again, checking a box, it's like, how can we engage in activities, right? And, and again, I, I'm sorry I've been saying data, 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 but we need to do almost kind of like a 360 review of our capacities to actually offer the, the services and the programs that we've been talking about today in a flexible way and just identify those gaps and then to your point, commit, right? Uh, look at our funds and see how we're going to gradually fill those gaps and help our students. Again, be learner centric. Uh, if we say it, let's do it, let's commit to it and invest in it. Uh, so that, um, again, we can be mo much more helpful than we are. Yeah, I think as long as it's like a consortium, like the online learning consortium and not, I, like, I don't think we're ready for a standard. I, I think we just have no idea what the right mix is. So it, it, if it's collaborative and collegial, like, great. Um, if it's like somebody trying to say, like, my way is the best way to do hybrid, I would kind of not be interested. I'm gonna say more of the same, <laughs> kind yeah, of like yeah. learn from your peers. And I think that we've already hit a lot of the points that would do that as well. Like asking the students as well and checking in with them is gonna give us a lot of traction because I think it's gonna be so unique individual to the program and to the way that institution is traditionally operated and then like going back to the persona of the student that's there. Very good point, yeah, because whatever is stewing and marinating over the next several years of you know what might develop, certainly important to have the student voice in that as well. Uh, but we're right at time, so we'll leave it there. Thank you so much to my uh, awesome guests here, for everybody in the room for hanging out and asking uh, great questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but um, yeah, it's a topic that I love talking about, so thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.